in this fourth video of Unit 1, Biology 101, I'll uh, go back and touch on principle and law. I was hurried in the last video. I'm not able to edit my videos. I apologize about that, so I just have to go with what I have, and I'm limited to 15 minutes. I didn't realize until after the 14-minute mark that I was running short on time. The principle is sometimes described as a theory that has universal support. A lot of support, uh, not much dissension, if any dissension, and uh, more narrow than a law. A law would be similar to a principle. It's something that has pretty much universal support and um, is important for some of the basics of science. A good example would be the law of gravity, the uh, first law of thermodynamics, the second law of thermodynamics, just to give a couple of examples, uh, two or three examples. Going on with the organization of life, we are interested in the, uh, in the organization within an organism and also above the organism. Within an organism, we can start at the atomic level. Atoms, uh, we'll talk about a little bit later, probably in chapter two, but uh, we understand that uh, atoms, as uh, seen in the periodic table, represent uh, different elements. And we can take atoms of elements and put them together, forming either covalent bonds or ionic bonds to form molecules or compounds. And I'm not so concerned about the difference at this point, molecules and compounds, but uh, when you have different atoms that have different characteristics joining together to form a molecule or a compound, oftentimes the molecule or compound will take on very different characteristics than the atoms that make it up. Those molecules can then be put together to form larger molecules and eventually organelles. One of the largest molecules that uh, you'll read about or learn about is DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. That's the, the chemical of life that helps to determine the characteristics of an organism. Molecules help to form organelles and you'll find organelles in organisms above the bacterial level. Bacteria don't have membrane-bound organelles but uh, protists and fungi and plants and animal cells do. And eventually, you have complexity that makes up a cell. Different organelles joining together make up cell. Uh, if it's a bacterial cell, just there are complex chemicals within the cell that help it to be alive and to function on its own. It's at the cellular level that most scientists consider life begins. Viruses are not considered to be living because they're not organized to the cellular level. But bacteria are. Bacteria are the simplest living creatures on the face of the earth. Above the cellular level, if you take cells that work together for a common function, those are called tissues. Later on in the semester, we will talk about four different types of tissues in animals and some different tissues in plants. Tissues that work together for a common function form what's called an organ. Organs that work together for a common function are called an organ system. And when you're talking about um, higher forms of life, these different organ systems help make up the organism. We see this especially in animals. Again, keep in mind, the organism can be very complex. If you consider humans, the most complex creatures on the face of the earth, or the organism can be a single-celled organism, such as bacteria or protists. Above the organism level, we have uh, what are called species, and uh, these are organisms of a, a single kind, and species are able to interbreed successfully and produce viable offspring. And uh, there are some exceptions to uh, the, that definition, but that's generally what we use. Bacteria a little bit different, but uh, we understand them as being very uh, similar if uh, you're talking about cells that make up a species. When you have a uh, species in a given area, specific area, it's called a population. Here in Illinois, we have a species white-tailed deer, and the white-tailed deer in Illinois could be referred to as a population, or we could actually 
consider smaller land areas and the population of white-tailed deer in a given area. When you have different populations of different organisms, we consider that a community. And in southern Illinois, we have a population of white-tailed deer, we have white oaks, we have red oaks, we have ash trees, we have alfalfa, we have beans, we have corn. All of that would be part of a community. When you consider the non-living component, along with the living organisms that make up the community, the non-living component with it makes up an ecosystem. And so, when you consider the ecosystem, you consider the gases that are dissolved to make up air, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon dioxide primarily. Consider the water, because all living organisms that are active need water. If you're considering white-tailed deer and the plants that they feed on, they would need a, a steady water supply. And all that makes up the ecosystem. And it should be noted, and I'll probably mention it later, but what runs any ecosystem ultimately is the sun. The sun is the ultimate energy source. And I talked about the sun and uh, understanding the sun a little bit later, or earlier. Some of the scientists in my thought, what, what does that have to do with science, and especially biology? Well, it, it has a lot to do with biology because uh, the sun is considered the ultimate energy source. And uh, that is it for this fourth video in the series.